to the final part of the Lover Upon trial. I have the feeling I might look very red. I'm taking anti-inflammatories for a frozen shoulder and it has for some reason made me very sensitive to sunlight. And I went out in the sun in the early morning and ended up completely sunburned. I was hoping the redness would fade before I had to record this video, but I actually think it's here for another several days. And because of my skin, I can't put anything on it like makeup, so I can't cover it. It's not really painful, it's just red. Hopefully it's not too distracting. And with that out of the way, I'm ready to talk about the book. This section takes us from page 130 to the end of the book at page 157. In the top of page 130, which is the bit that I finished on last week, Mrs. Leonard had asked if Lydia could come and stay with her for a week so they could attend a concert and I think in part because Dr. Leonard is away so much at the moment with this patient of his who presumably is going to die soon. She's asked if Lydia can visit her for a week from Thursday to Thursday. Mr. Falconer will be there until the Monday and after that it will just be Mrs. Leonard and Lydia. And Lydia is, of course, very excited about this, not only because Mrs. Leonard is her favourite person, but also because Mr. Falconer is a new favourite. She's rather fascinated by him. There were two people who weren't pleased by this, being Fred and Charles Mornington. Fred was only staying there for a fortnight until his mother and siblings went to the seaside and the plan was that he would join them at the seaside so he's actually going to be gone before Lydia comes back but although he's a bit put out by this it's not like he's an immediate suitor he's only 20. That was an age at which women got married but men didn't so he'd probably like Lydia to make some kind of promise to him that she'll wait but this doesn't actually affect his marriage chances at all. Whereas Charles has made visiting Lydia his whole life's work and he is rather disappointed by this. Mrs. Leonard had a plan that she and Lydia would go to a concert on the Friday night, I think it is, the day after Lydia arrives. And Charles Mornington decides that he will go there too. He's going to meet them at the concert just for that night because he can't go the whole week without seeing Lydia. With all that decided, Thursday comes and Lydia sets off for Mrs. Leonard's. Mrs. Leonard and Mr. Falconer had gone straight back after the dinner, which I think was a Tuesday, so I think it's only a couple of days on from that. Lydia's father is driving her to Mrs. Leonard's. On the journey, Sir William takes the opportunity to discuss the Charles Mornington business and says he hopes that Lydia is still looking for good things in him and he's still hopeful of a positive result. Lydia is diplomatically honest with him and says, I still don't think it's going to go the way you'd like it to. How long do we have to keep this up? At what point has it been long enough? At what point will you accept that I've given this a good shot and made up my mind? Sir William can't really do anything but reiterate the arguments he's already made, that Lydia has a habit of being rash, that Mr. Mornington might have hidden qualities that need to be pulled out, that he is a good sort of person and seems very stable. And Lydia says, you could say all the same things about a dress. If I was choosing a dress, I'd be looking for good fabric. I'd be looking for something that wore well. I'd be looking for something that washed well. But even with a dress, I'm not going to buy it if it has all those qualities unless I feel good in it. And it's it's the same to a much greater degree with a husband. And she says, tell me, Papa, when you decided to marry Mama, did you marry her just because she had good qualities? Weren't you a little bit influenced by her personality and her looks? And so William actually doesn't have an answer to this. So the conversation ends. They reach Mrs. Leonard's, so William leaves her and goes. There's a bit of description of the house, how it is cheerful and pretty and the weather is bright and exhilarating. Remember that Lydia, when she's in a good mood, she sees the good in everything. When she's in a bad mood, she sees the bad in everything. Everything's good today. The house is at the entrance of the town, but detached from all the others because you actually don't want your house to be too near the others. 
has a large and picturesque garden attached to it with a view of the far off hills, a small but pretty suite of sitting rooms furnished with good though simple taste and a piano forte, books, drawings, works of art. Everything is nice. It's not a grand house like the Grange but it's quite good enough for a doctor. I think that this house, given that it's got a suite of sitting rooms, that's not just a sitting room, but a suite of sitting rooms. I guess it's like the Bennett's house in Pride and Prejudice. It's still a decent sized house. She's still got servants or at least a servant or two. It's just a standard gentleman's house, not a manor. Mr. Falconer is out when she arrives. So she has a few hours conversation just with Mrs. Leonard. There's a whole page about friendships between people of different ages, how it's good for a young girl to have an older friend, depending on who that friend is and what their qualities are. But Mrs. Leonard has had a very steadying effect on Lydia. And I think now that we know about Clarissa's death, you can see that Mrs. Leonard has become a sort of a counsellor therapist for Lydia as well as a friend. That said, she doesn't force confidences, which is why she made this assumption back at the Grange that Lydia's distraction was because she was thinking about Charles Mornington. She's waiting for Lydia to share that with her. So Lydia did not see Mr. Falconer until they met at dinner. And it says, what an agreeable dinner that was. Mr. Falconer's powers of conversation were surpassed only by his almost boundless information. And remember, Lydia loves to learn things. She's really impressed by somebody who knows a whole lot of stuff, who can teach her things. How pleased he appeared with all that Lydia uttered. Mrs. Leonard kept the conversation into areas that Lydia knew something about so that Lydia would feel comfortable. And so Lydia appeared to advantage. Then, between dinner and tea, they sauntered in the pretty garden, and Lydia could not complain that the glories of an evening sky were lost upon Falconer, as they had been upon Mornington. And you see, that's what we're going to see now, is all the things that she did, all the conversations she had with Charles. She has basically a similar conversation with Mr. Falconer, with very different results. Mr. Falconer knows the right things to say. He knows the right things to think. How differently did Mr. Falconer talk upon the distant lands he had visited? What he saw and where he explored and how he hates the superficial. And in the evening, lights are brought, tea is over. Mrs. Leonard persuaded Mr. Falconer to read to them. He agreed and asked Lydia, what would you like me to read? She said Milton. And Mrs. Leonard chose the particular work of Milton and Mr. Falconer read it. Mr. Falconer has a very thorough understanding of Milton and knows exactly how to read it to the greatest advantage. Before they parted for the night, Mrs. Leonard sang two or three of Lydia's favourites. Lydia went to the pianoforte. Falconer did not follow her, but his eyes did. Mrs. Leonard finished singing and Lydia says, I wish I could sing like that, to which Mr. Falconer says, your speaking voice is music. Do not wish for so much. Mrs. Leonard rose to light her candle and while she'd stepped away from them, he added gently, you are already only too charming. So Lydia goes to bed in a very happy state of mind. And the book says she thought more than she slept that night. The next day is Friday and it passed pleasantly. Charles Mornington arrived in the afternoon because they're all going off to the concert. Mrs. Leonard, believing there was some decided understanding between him and Lydia, thought it would be right to ask him to dine. And he did, which Lydia finds very annoying. She loved the concert. Lydia was almost breathless from intense listening. There were those large, half-loving, half-searching eyes bent upon her, every now and then quietly withdrawn, it is true. This is Mr. Falconer's eyes, when she seemed to observe them, but only to return again with an expression of too deep an admiration to be misunderstood. Seated by her side, he seemed to feel the charm of the music nearly as much as herself. All his remarks betrayed the most perfect taste and refined discrimination, and during the intermission, he 
gave Lydia a short and spirited history of music, dwelling particularly on Greek influences, and this impresses Lydia enormously. All this time, Charles Mornington is sitting on the other side of her, but she scarcely notices him. She and Mr Falconer are just talking the whole time. She's not deliberately being rude, she's just absolutely caught up with Mr Falconer and hasn't really thought about Mr Mornington. Charles Mornington, poor soul, could not but observe the pleasure Lydia experienced in talking to and being talked to by Falconer. And thus the concert was so many hours lost to the lover upon trial and gave him more pain than pleasure. And so the days pass. Lydia had not been aware how keen the enjoyment of existence could be until the occurrence of those few happy days. Mr Falconer was so constantly with them and there was so much of that sort of conversation that apparently gives such real insight into character and opinions that at the end of the third day Lydia felt as if she had known him for months. For in the society of Mrs Leonard and Lydia, Mr Falconer threw aside all reserve. By Saturday afternoon, Mr Falconer had decided that he didn't have to leave on Monday after all. He could stay until the Thursday, the same day that Lydia was leaving. Lydia is very pleased about this too. On Sunday, they went to the cathedral. Lydia prayed and she went and had a look at the family monument at her sister's name. As she gazed upon it, she wondered that she had almost wished she'd been buried by her side. How could she wish to leave this delightful world? A world where there was so much to enjoy. People whom she could like and look up to and listen to and find herself improving every hour. So that was Sunday. On Monday, it's raining. Mr Falconer has a very big umbrella and he convinces Mrs Leonard and Lydia to walk with him into the town of El, remember they're right at the edge of that town, to the cathedral so he could have a look at the cathedral the way they did before with Mr Mornington. Mr Falconer doesn't know much about the cathedral or architecture so he doesn't make as good a showing in that way but he is such a charming companion and he learns very fast. He makes such excellent conjectures that it's a wonderful day anyway. They were both quite surprised at the way he had already mastered all that was most essential to the knowledge of this new study. He was much amused at their surprise saying he had all his life been used to work his mind. So now he could learn anything very fast. When they returned to Mrs. Leonard's, Mr. Falconer was so interested in cathedrals that he decided to get out a book and read some more. But he made sure that Lydia was seated beside him to help him. The days fled rapidly and Thursday came far too soon. But Mrs. Leonard had on that morning one of her bad nervous headaches and remained in her own apartment. So Lydia and Mr. Falconer breakfasted without her. This is the Thursday morning. Falconer was grave and rather absent and looked at her less than usual. Soon after breakfast he said he must pack up his things. Lydia remained alone. She took up Milton and read through it and remembered how she had heard it read. She remembered Mr Falconer reading it. She closed her eyes and called back all the pleasures of that night. The sentence that Mr Falconer had said on that first night came back as well. Do not wish for so much. You are but too charming already. She's still in a dream. It's all gone so perfectly. And Mr Falconer has been everything that she could ever want in a man. Everything that she told Sir William that she wanted. He's packed his stuff and he comes back into the room and walked up to the window and looked out and at his watch. And he said, nearly time, in a low voice. Then, after a pause, he walked quickly up to Lydia and said, My friend Mrs Leonard took me to task yesterday convicted me of, I fear, a fault, and I am come to ask your pardon for it. This is all a bit confusing to Lydia. She observed, he continued, that I looked at you very often and very long. She says, too often. Mr Falconer says that he told Mrs Leonard why he was looking at her, and now he was about to confess to Lydia. Lydia bowed her head slightly, but did not speak. She wished she did not feel her heart beating as it did, but she was full of... Of what? Hopes and fears and expectations. The first moment I beheld you, Falconer continued, I was fascinated. Fascinated with Miss Lydia Middlemore. 
but I was doubly so. For my heart is in the possession of one as fair and lovely as yourself. And to her my hand is promised, as soon as some difficulties can be removed. See, he said rather hurriedly, he took a miniature out of his waistcoat, that's like a little painting, and handed it to Lydia and said, have a look, can you see the resemblance? Poor Lydia, what a revulsion of feelings had one short moment occasioned. What an unlooked for termination to her recent vague surmises. And she stands there battling this deluge of emotions and disappointments. Because really he had given her every reason to believe he was interested in her. He had paid her compliments. His attention was on her constantly for the whole week. He had extended his stay. He was going to go on Monday and he had extended his stay to Thursday. So he would leave when she left. And now suddenly he's telling her that he's engaged. Lydia keeps control and she handles it with the greatest of dignity. I was really pleased with her in this scene. She does so well. She took the miniature and she turned away as if to get more light and took a few steps away from him so she could recover her composure without him noticing. The picture does indeed look like her. The girl's name is Selena and she's a few years older than Lydia but Lydia can see the resemblance. It's the last thing she wants to be looking at right now. She turned it mechanically on the other side was a thick plait of brown hair and in the centre the name Selina in tiny seed pearls. Now, resumed Falconer more easily, you can understand and I pray pardon my too frequent gazes. He dared not say my marked attention to you, although he perhaps thought it. If you are still unforgiving, I must entreat Mr Mornington to mediate on my behalf. Lydia gave him back the miniature and said quietly but firmly, this is important in the story. She said quietly but firmly, Mr. Mornington has no earthly influence over me, so pray let me undeceive you if you have judged so erroneously on that point. Indeed, said Falconer. Well then, I may say I did hope, nay, believed, there was nothing in what I heard. A change passed over his face, one impossible for Lydia to understand. Thoughts seemed passing through his mind which he either could not nor would not utter. It took me a few reads to really work out what was going on here and down the track. What it seems to be is he had a fiance, Selena, and he has been flirting outrageously with Lydia. That's true. He, that's what he's doing. And the only reason he has fronted up now is because last night, Mrs. Leonard told him that Lydia was as good as engaged to Charles Mornington, which has made Mr. Falconer think that Charles Mornington might come after him because he has been flirting outrageously with Charles Mornington's fiance. Although Lydia doesn't know much about it, Charles Mornington is a big, strong man and a very good shot. And in this circumstance would have every right to demand satisfaction of Mr. Falconer. So Mr. Falconer is covering his back here. If Mrs. Leonard hadn't said that, Mr. Falconer wouldn't have said a word about Selena. Probably would have arranged to see her later on so they could continue this flirtation. Because he is enjoying Lydia's company. He wouldn't have done it right now. He would have done it later if Mrs. Leonard hadn't said that about Charles Mornington, which made him feel he had to protect himself from that problem. This all kind of comes out in the writing, but it's easier for me to just say it here. So that's what's going on. Lydia hasn't quite cottoned onto that at this point though. All she knows is that the fact that she's not engaged to Charles Mornington has caused Mr. Falconer to think some thoughts that he's not uttering. And he goes on to say, I haven't seen this dear one, Selena, for many months. I almost fancied when I was with you that I was once again in her presence, listening to her voice. You'll understand that I found it difficult to take my eyes from her living likeness. Say no more, said Lydia, rallying courageously and in a cheerful tone of voice. I ought to be too much flattered to feel angry at being considered like anything so beautiful. Yet, when she thought of the false translation, that's the German song that started the whole business, and of a whole week's unremitting attention, she did think she might have some reason to be angry, but she would sooner have died than insinuated as much. 
So his carriage comes up and he says, I hope we remain friends. And off he goes. Now that he's gone, Lydia can let herself feel what she really feels. She's looking back at the whole week and thinking that it was a bright and deceitful dream. She's thinking about what he says and she's doubting and she's thinking, is it really just that I looked like Selena? Was that really all there was to it? And she's thinking, no, no, that wasn't the impression at all. It was too real. He was very much paying attention to her. It wasn't simply the likeness. He must have had penetration enough to discern that she was not indifferent to him. And thus, he risked making an impression on one who had no idea of his engagement. All the good things about him come back to her. The wonderful week they had, the way he could read Milton, the way he talked of travel, the way he did everything right. The way he knew so much. He had such intelligence. He was so good looking and those big eyes that were looking at her all the time. If he didn't have Selena, he would have loved me. That's what she's thinking. It would have been me he was going to marry. The thought shot through her with a tolerably sharp pang of regret. And then Charles Mornington comes into her head. In contrast, she realises in this moment that there is absolutely no way she can marry Charles Mornington. The decision is made. Mr Falconer didn't treat her well and he's gone now, but nobody can compare to Mr Falconer still. Certainly Charles can't even attempt to. She had been for a whole week domesticated with a being in whom was united, apparently, almost all those requisites she had communicated to her father on the day she was first informed of Mornington's proposal. My father was wrong, she thinks. Men like that do exist. Anyway, she's got another few hours there before she's heading off home. And I don't know what vehicle she's driving because Sir William drove her there. So I don't understand. But it says that she's going to drive home in the cool of the evening. Mrs. Leonard recovered from her headache in time to join her for lunch and for the last few hours before Lydia goes. Mrs. Leonard looked upon a very different Lydia to the one from whom she had parted the preceding evening. In spite of every effort, her telltale countenance and varying complexion betokened that some struggle was going on within. Mrs. Leonard was a very decided person and never shrank from doing what she thought for the best because it might happen to be irksome. And so she asks Lydia what's wrong. And she says that she hoped Mr Falconer explained and she considered it quite reprehensible. It is a liberty no man has a right to permit himself to take but an accepted lover. Lydia says as carelessly as she can, oh yes, he explained. It would have been very injudicious on my part had I made it a matter of any consequence. But at that point she can't talk anymore for a minute. She pauses and thinks about her words. I thought it due to myself, she says. He told me he'd heard I was engaged to Mr Mornington and I set him clear on that because Mr Mornington is nothing to me. This is something Mrs Leonard hadn't been able to discuss with Lydia until now. Shall I say, dear Lydia, that I am truly glad of it? I cannot think he is a desirable husband for such a girl as you. But how comes it that appearances were so much in favour of this? Meaning, why did you not just send him packing from the start? And then Lydia explains yet again that her father had wanted her to spend as much time as she could in his company and find all the good in him, and that's what she was doing. Lydia tells her that Mr Falconer had said he didn't think there could be an engagement, that that had to be a mistake. Mrs. Leonard is rather concerned that they even had that conversation, that Mr. Falconer and Lydia even talked of that, because it's a very intimate thing to say, and it implies that they're communicating on a much closer level than she was aware of. Lydia forced herself to speak unconcernedly. He said he had hoped, had felt almost sure, that there was nothing in what he'd heard. Mrs. Leonard saw and did not like her constrained manner, for she was certain that there was a lurking sadness beneath it. And taking Lydia's hand, she said, My dearest Lydia, had I not imagined that you were engaged to Mr. Mornington, I would never have allowed you here with Mr. Falconer. He's a clever and at times even a fascinating man. But he has no principles whatsoever and he is a fatalist. He believes that destiny is predetermined and it doesn't matter what he does, 
it's going to end up the same way so he may as well just follow his every whim. Mrs Leonard didn't think that was going to be an issue because Mr Falconer rarely exerted himself to be charming. He could be really charming when he wanted but usually he didn't say much at all which is how he was with Louisa back at the dinner at the Grange. He hardly said a word Louisa didn't see him as a particularly sociable person and that's because he just didn't bother. He's not even a very polite man, honestly. He is an absolute charmer but he only bothers when he gets something out of it I suppose really. So he went all out with Lydia basically to make her fall in love with him. Mrs Leonard hadn't expected that to happen. And Lydia is listening very carefully to everything Mrs Leonard says about him and his views and his lack of principles. Effectively, along with everything else, he's a womanizer. Mrs. Leonard says, Lydia, dearest, never think of any man as a husband to whom you cannot cling, not only with fond affection, but with perfect confidence in his principles. Lydia drew a long breath, paused a moment, then with sweet and winning frankness said, My dear kind friend, I see by your penetrating look and by what you've been saying that you are afraid. Mr Falconer has made something of an impression on my mind. Heart, perhaps you would say. To a degree that might be the case. And she goes on to explain that yes, she is a little bit in love with Mr Falconer, but she'll get over it. I never happened to meet with so delightful and agreeable a man, yet, as I am confessing all to you, I will now say I do think his manner towards me has been inconsiderate and ill-judged, one would almost fancy he wished to make such an impression, engaged though he is. So she told Mrs Leonard everything, the German song and all of his little compliments that he's paid her and the way he's been looking at her. She goes on and makes a grand speech and her pride holds her up. She's going to push through, she keeps herself together. She finishes with, how fortunate it is after all that I have not been tried by a proposal from such a man because she's thinking she's so in love with him that even knowing that he was a man who cheated on his fiancée and could never be trusted, she'd still say yes to him. She loves him so much. So it's a good thing that he didn't want her. She's trying so hard and she's feeling so very unhappy, but that's how she's choosing to console herself. And then Lydia drives home and she is entirely on her own. So I don't know what, what vehicle she's got. Maybe it's one of Mrs. Leonard's. She had a solitary drive home for which she was not sorry. Her heart and mind were full, painfully so, and solitude in consequence was rather welcome to her. And she's really struggling. There is a sort of blank left in a woman's mind when the attentions, the constant flattering attentions of a very delightful man are irrevocably terminated. But Lydia, it says, has a strong and a right mind. She felt she had had a wound in her heart, but she confessed to herself that it was too recent and she hoped too slight not to be shortly healed. For although her feelings were vivid, Lydia wasn't sentimental or prone to give way. Once again, she tells herself, no, Mr Mornington, it can't be. There is no way, especially after meeting Mr Falconer, it, there is doubly no way. She has these moments where she's thinking, maybe it was all wrong. Maybe we made mistakes. Maybe I just misheard everything. Maybe Mr. Falconer does like me. Maybe he's not going to get married to Selena after all. He said there were obstacles to that. Maybe he will give up on Selena and come to me instead. So her heart and her brain are kind of tricking her and giving her these hopes. And then she's thinking, no, don't think about it. It's not going to happen that way. I know better, really. My head knows better. And so she gets home. Everybody meets her at the door except Fred, who's gone. Mr. Charles Mornington is also there to meet her. She's not happy to see him once again. She's particularly not happy to see him because she doesn't want him to see how unhappy she is. She's just got to keep her guard up. Everything that happened at L with a long dash was soon told to Louisa who in her straightforward way expressed her disapprobation of Mr Falconer's inconsiderate conduct. Lydia sighed and said nothing, but affectionately pressed the dear hand that held her own. She tried to look on that delightful week merely as a dream, too charming to be ever realised. Lady Middlemore is even more annoyed and just thinks this should never have happened. And she feels that this is going to have rather severe consequences, that it was much better that Lydia would never learn that such men really were out there in the world 
but now she has met one it was what Sir William said at the start that if such men are out there they're not going to be interested in Lydia she's not important enough they don't rank enough she's not rich enough to attract anybody like that but it's happened and you can't go back from it the mother felt he was to blame and her heart ached for her daughter's disappointed feelings but there was no use in lamenting and regretting she could only hope the impression would be neither deep nor lasting Charles Mornington visits every day and Lydia is thinking she can't endure it much longer. Mr Mornington's few fond hopes began rapidly to die away and he came to the melancholy conclusion that if in a few days time Lydia's coldness did not give way, he would give up his suit altogether. Poor Sir William too was becoming almost hopeless on the subject. He feared everything for the lover upon trial. And of course, Charles Mornington doesn't know that this isn't only her being cold about him, but she's so sad and she can't tell him why. She can't explain why. So she's just dealing with her feelings. She's just going through the motions every day, holding her misery inside. And then we come into the fullness of summer and what is pretty much the final scene in the whole book. The weather had lately set in with such extreme heat that the sisters passed the greater part of the afternoon under the shade of some of their fine trees, sketching and reading aloud. So all four of the girls are out there pretty much every day. I'm thinking once again that Flora must be about maybe 11 years old and Fanny is around seven. That's that's my final conclusion here. And the two boys who are away at boarding school, I'd say must be around 16 and 13. They're in between Lydia and Flora. But anyway, they're sitting outside under the tree on this particular very hot day. Charles Mornington comes and joins them. Louisa is doing needlework and Fanny is making daisy chains. Lydia doesn't want to talk to Charles Mornington, so she asks him to read from... There's a review sitting there. It's a fairly heavy article, so she just says, can you read that to us? And that means she doesn't have to talk. Charles Mornington is not a very good reader. As we covered before, he doesn't have much education. And this is a particularly heavy work, and it's a very hot day. But Lydia has asked it of him, so he does it. And as he's reading, which he's doing in a very slow, ponderous way without feeling, her mind wanders. But it's such a long article that when her mind wanders back to us, he's still reading it. Nobody even knows that her mind was wandering. Poor Charles Mornington found this reading aloud so heavy a task that every now and then a yawn betrayed the ennui he really did feel. Yet on he went, quite mechanically, and thought no more of what he was uttering than the giddy little Fanny at his side who was making an endless daisy chain, and at last she began twining it around Mornington's hat, which lay on the grass by his side. He was seated on the lowest of all low garden stools, so low that Fanny was seized with a desire to twist it round what she had heard her sister Lydia, in her presence, imprudently call his stubble hair. Now that requires some explanation. She does not mean beard. When we talk about stubble, we're talking about chin hair. She actually means the hair on his head because it's sort of strangely bushy, like she feels that it doesn't sit quite right. And she said one day to Louisa, and this must be off screen somewhere, perhaps the author would have gone back and put it in had she had the opportunity. She said somewhere to Louisa that she thought it must be a wig. She didn't really mean it. She was just being a bit mean. His hair is so unnatural it could be a wig. Since that time, Fanny has wanted to know if it is. And now Fanny is thinking maybe if she wraps the daisy chain around his head, she'll be able to feel it and feel if it's a wig or not. Fanny took advantage of the watchful Louisa's eyes being bent over some rather difficult work. Mr Mornington, however, began to be a little fidgeted by her amusement, for he took hold of Fanny gently, as if to draw her away, though he continued reading, when, oh wonder and horror, Fanny gave a sudden scream, and the party, looking up, beheld in her hand, and parted from his head, the crown of his unhappy chevalure for part of the stubble hair was indeed false, and the top of his poor skull was now perfectly bald. If ever there was a climax to misery, this was one. 
It was impossible to resist it. The sisters, even the prudent and kind Louisa, laughed until nearly exhausted. Fanny, conscious of having got into a most awful scrape, scampered away as fast as her legs would carry her crown in hand. Charles Mornington ran after her, but she had the advantage of at least a hundred yards, so that the unlucky man had a good run before catching the culprit and recovering his stolen locks. At last he reached her, and the sisters beheld him from afar, recovering his bald pate. What was to be done? Now that the unavoidable, irrepressible merriment had, done, had its vent, Louisa and Lydia felt truly distressed. Lydia went off immediately to lecture Fanny, who had skulked into the house. Flora retired to her own little garden far away. Whilst Louisa, the ever thoughtful, kind, consoling Louisa, remained where she was, thinking how best she could succeed in smoothing down this most vexatious business. When Charles Mornington comes back to her, she says, I hope you will forgive Fanny her almost unpardonable liberty. Charles Mornington says, oh, I bear her no malice. She's such a mere child, but that all, that your sister Lydia should have so laughed at me. Well, perhaps, added the good-natured man, it could hardly be helped. No doubt I should have laughed also had I not been the sufferer. But now, Miss Middlemore, and he paused, looking sad and embarrassed, I shall take this opportunity of saying what I know I should shortly have been compelled to express to the rest of your family. And to you, I would rather say it than to any other. You are always so kind. I'm going away to a friend in Scotland. I give up all hope that your sister will ever care for me. How can I expect it? I'm not worthy of her. She has borne with me, I know, because Sir William wished her to do it. But that is all. Pray don't think that I'm foolish enough to be influenced by this last half hour's business. That would not weigh with me for a moment if I had the faintest hope. But I have none. Say all that is kind and grateful from me to Sir William and Lady Middlemore. I'll be absent for some months. And he has a pencil case that Fanny liked and he gives that to Louisa and says, give this to Fanny so she knows I'm not actually mad at her. And off he goes. Thus ended the visits of the lover upon trial. It was a tragicomic finale, certainly, and Fanny was many days in disgrace. But eventually the family carried on and lived normally. Lydia heard from time to time of the rapid success and brilliant career of the celebrated lawyer, Mr. Falconer, and read the announcement of his marriage in the paper about a year after she had parted from him. He had moved heaven and earth to accomplish the fulfilment of his wishes on that point. Three years after his marriage, Lydia read in the paper the account of Mr. Falconer's elopement with the beautiful Mrs. P, the wife of an eminent brother lawyer and an intimate friend of his own. His career in life was now altogether checked. He, what he'd just done was so bad that he couldn't carry on as a lawyer. No one could trust such a man, of whom even the most thoughtless part of the world would declare that Falconer, though well-versed in law, had proved that he knew nothing of equity. He never rose in his profession again. Poor Selina, fortunate Lydia, said the latter to herself after this terrible affair became known to her. When I was acquainted with him, I could imagine no greater happiness than being his wife. He is the only man I have ever seen who I think I could have fondly loved. I did so like him, but it was a good thing after all that he liked Selina, not me. Still, it is difficult to meet with the one who you could be really happy with for life and never have them. And this continued to be her problem. She's still in love with him. He is still, even after all this time, and she's thinking quite rationally about it, he still has all those qualities that she wants in a husband. If she could meet someone else like him, she would probably forget Mr. Falconer. But she isn't. There's no one else in her world. Mr. Falconer remains the best she's ever seen. And because she continues to be in love with Mr. Falconer, she refuses any other proposals she has. And apparently she does have a few others. Louisa married a man called Arthur Selby, who was referenced right at the start. Arthur was an excellent person and made Louisa perfectly happy. Lydia looks at him and thinks, well, he wouldn't do me as a husband. But she can see that Louisa is happy. Flora also married sooner than might have been expected. Lydia continued single. And as her mother once told her with a mind like hers, she had her enjoyments 
what happened with Mr. Falconer stayed with her, that not only was he the one that she still really loves, but that he turned out to be so untrustworthy. And she's thinking to herself, I can't really make that call. I can't look at somebody and judge whether they can be trusted or not. And it confirms the opinion in her that talent alone in a man will not ensure a wife's happiness. Between her home duties, her married sisters, and the assistance she gave her mother in finishing the education of the wild but clever and good-hearted Fanny, she had little time to think of the passing of her own single life, or to allow her mind to dwell upon it. She spends her time visiting with her married sisters and travelling the continent and sometimes spending time at home because she's still living at the Grange. And though she still felt the truth of her mother's assertion that married life was the most desirable lot for women, she always continued to say and to feel that you had to be married to the right person. So Lydia Middlemore, though so attractive and admired, lived to be an old maid, but was fortunate enough never to be the cause of exciting any of the ridicule she had once so powerfully anticipated from single blessedness. And single blessedness hers really was, for she found she made the happiness not of one individual, but of many. And when the awful hour came that she had to print upon her visiting cards, Mrs. Lydia Middlemore, she could even smile cheerfully as she looked upon them. And that is the end of the story. So, there's a few things I want to say there. One is, that ending may not make much sense, but she stayed single until she was very old, and there comes a time in a single lady's life when they are beyond all possibility of getting married in the 1800s, when they will just start calling themselves Misses. And that is what she's doing at the end. When she's signing her name, Mrs. Lydia Middlemore, it just means she's old lady Lydia Middlemore. So the other thing I want to say about that is, of course, that this is not the ending we come to expect of a book from this generation. Here we've got Lydia who had all the abilities, all the skills. She's basically the Mary Sue of the story. All the men fell in love with her, yet she stayed single to the end of her days. And because she didn't find the right man to marry her, that is the better choice to make. It's absolutely not what we've come to expect of a Victorian book. And that's one of the reasons that I chose this book to talk about. I feel that this was a sort of pushback against the predominant patrilineal notions of that time. We've sort of been trained into the idea that marriage is the happy ending for a woman. The author liked Lydia. That does come through. She's very sympathetic to Lydia, and yet she's chosen this resolution, that Lydia will remain single rather than settle for somebody who doesn't really suit. So what sort of book is this? Because by modern definitions, it's not a romance. It would be a romance because it's about a beautiful girl in lower aristocracy who receives an offer of marriage, all the elements are there for this to be a traditional romance. By modern terms, a romance needs to end with the couple getting together, so it's not a romance. So what is it? I don't really have an answer to that. My next thought, which is really a question, is I'm not sure if this is a happy ending or a sad ending for the author. I'm not sure what she considers this to be because it comes across as a compromise. But when I look closely at it, I actually think she's saying that this is a good life for Lydia. Lydia is more fulfilled living this way without a family than she would be if she had married and become a wife and mother. This way, she can be the devoted aunt, cousin. She can be everything to all the people in the family and she can still keep her health because childbirth was a dangerous business and maintain a level of emotional and spiritual safety that she wouldn't have if she got married. So I do think the author is very strongly saying this is an option. For, for some very poor unfortunate girls this wasn't an option of course. The only thing they could do was marry the first man who would have them. That is simply a tragedy. That is not the way life was meant to work. Even in Victorian England the idea was that a woman would marry somebody to whom she was well suited and who she could compliment in turn. 
Which I guess brings me to the point that I probably should have begun on, which is that this book clearly is an examination of marriage from start to finish. That's what it's talking about. It talks about the marriage between Sir William and Lady Middlemore. It touches on the marriage of Dr. Leonard and Mrs. Leonard. It doesn't really, but there are a few sentences included here or there that fill in details of that marriage. And Lydia's three suitors all have some different vice or fault that she needs to consider. For Charles Mornington, it's that they have very unequal intellects. When it comes to brain power, Lydia can run rings around him. For Fred, it's that he had a violent temper. And for Mr. Falconer, it is clearly that he can't be trusted. And we also touch at the end very briefly on the marriage of Louisa and Arthur Selby. I didn't talk about Arthur Selby before. I kind of forgot he came back at the end. But in her very first talk in the library with her parents, when Sir William told Lydia that she had an offer of marriage, they do briefly mention Arthur Selby as being a long-term suitor for Louisa that her parents weren't terribly pleased with for some reason. They didn't see him as important enough for Louisa, but he and Louisa had formed an attachment quite early on. Arthur wasn't in the book, but he sort of sat in the background. So I think that is looking at another type of marriage where people were friends from childhood. I presume that's acceptable to the author because they've had time to really know each other. They've had time to move through stages of infatuation and learn each other's good and bad points. So if you can't find somebody with whom you are just perfectly compatible and entirely on the same page with in the normal way, which I think is how we were meant to view Sir William and Lady Middlemore, although that really didn't look like an ideal marriage to me, I think we were meant to view them that way. If you can't have that, then the next best thing is somebody that you have known for a very, very long time. Not that the author ever highlighted any of that. She did go into a whole lot of asides and rambles and soliloquies on different matters. She never actually gave any direct opinions about marriage other than that a woman can't marry someone if she can't rely on their principles. And I think also you can't marry somebody who you're afraid of. That if you do marry somebody, you do sometimes have to make compromises to make it work. But overall, that marriage isn't the only option for a woman. And it's quite true. There were a lot of women who never got married in every century. They seem to be forgotten in literature very often. Even in the classics today, the ones we see the most, the ones that seem to get the most love from modern audiences are the ones where the heroine will get married to the hero and have that kind of a happy ending. I very much appreciate that Augusta Lyons presented a different happy ending. A happy ending by staying single. And there's a couple of other side points that occurred to me when I read this book and now that I'm thinking about it. One is that Lydia throughout came across to me as a kind of Mary Sue character, especially since everywhere she went, every man she met fell in love with her. Even though Louisa all the way through was supposed to be the attractive one. She clearly wasn't. It was Lydia and every man she met just fell over their feet in front of her. That's a trope that you don't really expect to see from the Victorian era. Of course it's always been around but if that's what she had, if that's what Lydia was, then the author did subvert that a bit by saying she was so perfect, so lovable, so talented, so beautiful, so everything that she no longer fitted into her world and she couldn't get married. She couldn't have that traditional happy ending because she was not a traditional average everyday woman. I don't think the author was saying that this is a better way to live. Even Lydia acknowledged that the ideal way for a woman to live was to be married. The other thing is to have a beautiful, talented woman in a story about marriage who stays single at the end of it kind of calls out all the internalised misogyny in the reader. I think that's probably more the case for a modern reader now than it was for a reader in those times because we've established the tropes now. We've established what is supposed to happen in a happy ending. We have established that if you have a book about marriage and a book about a marriage offer that the expected ending is that she will find herself 
the proper husband. And when that doesn't happen, you're left feeling a little bit blank. It's like what the author said about Lydia driving home, how if she's had all the flattering attentions of an attractive man and those attentions have suddenly been withdrawn, she is left with a blank in her life. She's feeling the absence of it. It's a bit like that when you read a book about marriage and she ends up single, not married at all. I love the way it flies in the face of expectations. And I love it even more because it is a book from the Victorian era. As a woman who lived in 1850, she was comfortable with her main female character staying single to the end of her days. This book was, I think, targeting women readers. It was targeting younger women. And I think it was saying, if you're not happy with your options, you don't have to get married. I think that was the thesis of the book. It's good if you can, but if you don't like the men around you, don't settle. Settling is always wrong. It's always the way to a miserable married life. I love that as a message. There were a few little problems with the book plot-wise, not major ones. It held together fairly well, but there were a few points, for instance, the discussion between Louisa and Lydia about the wig that actually wasn't on page. I think had Augusta Lyons lived long enough, she would have gone back and fixed those things. It's a shame we didn't get to see how she might have polished the book up. That wasn't too big a drama. It's still a book that holds together very well. I've put a link to a copy of this book online in the description. It is a book in the public domain, so it's a free read. It is a bit of a convoluted read in places. I haven't really decided what book I'm going to read next. I might do a few shorter reviews before I launch into another long one. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.